Before we begin, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors at Audible. Now that the weather's getting nicer, I'm back to reading and listening to books in the park. And with Audible, it's never been easier. Every month, I get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection. In addition, I get access to news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. If you go to audibletrial.com slash ymopodcast, you'll get two free audiobooks on us. Download thousands of titles offline anytime, anywhere. Having trouble deciding what to pick? Audible lets you keep your credits for up to a year. Find your summer read and support your favorite National Film Registry podcast. Once again, that's audibletrial.com slash ymopodcast. Thank you for your support. And now, on with the show. Gentlemen, what's your favorite case of an actor turned director? So it was interesting. I, I think I had a different answer for this when we conceived of the question. And then I started thinking about it and realized that my pick is actually somebody who hasn't directed a lot of films. And I think that a lot of people don't think of them as a director. You know, there, there are plenty of actor turned directors who we now think of as directors primarily. And we go, oh, they used to act. You know, one has to imagine that, uh, that that's going to be how we view maybe, uh, you know, uh, a Greta Gerwig or, or somebody who, you know, had acted, but now, you know, we're really talking about them as directors. Even Quentin Tarantino, you know, started technically as an actor. He's in the background of the Golden Girls, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, for an episode. But I'm thinking the exact opposite, which is somebody who is one of the biggest stars in the world, uh, but was also a director and only directed a few times. Uh, and I wish had directed more, but. Uh, they just got into the Criterion Collection, so I think that's, you know, the recognition is there. I think it's Barbara Streisand. Uh, you know, I think one of the most incredible things that a an actor-turned-director can do is when you watch those films, because they've obviously been in the industry so long, and, and there are so many people who are actors who decide to direct, and then you watch their debut or you watch their early films and kind of go, they don't really know who they are yet. You know, it feels a little amateurish. And there's plenty of actors who direct like one movie and then never again because it's not very good. What is incredible about Streisand as a director is that from the first go, you know, uh, from something like a Yentl or whatever, you look at and just go like, this is, yeah, yeah you figured out how to express yourself in the medium of film. You figured out how to put what you do and your vibe on film. And obviously that, you know, the, the perfect example of that is Prince of Tides, which is just a it's not just that it's a good movie. You know, Spielberg had that line, I guess Prince of Tides directed itself. Uh but when you actually watch Prince of Tides, it's not just because, oh well this is a really good movie. You realize this is a incredibly well directed movie. It is an incredibly well made film. I would love Barbara Streisand to direct things again. I think she's perfectly happy just doing you know, just kinda hanging. But um I, I think that her work as a director uh, deserves far more recognition. I think it got a lot of backlash just because of who she was, which is a fantastic actor turned director. So I'm going second on this one because the answer with me is obvious. It's it's like there's not a surprise coming here. It's Clint Eastwood. Uh he's a uh, one of my favorite performers of all time. I could watch any movie he he's in and and enjoy myself because he's just such a great presence and had such a good eye for picking movies like he was never in a, like a complete utterly unwatchable train wreck he not everything was gold but everything was like because of his presence watchable uh but his shift to directing was just such a thing nobody expected to was going to be a good idea because he wasn't really respected at the time but he was a guy who worked with some absolute top-notch director Sergio Leone Don Siegel you know so and he learned from everybody. He learned from the industry. And a lot like Cassavetes, honestly, he learned a lot about what's wrong with the industry and how not to make a movie. And there is an almost Cassavetian quality to his movies. He's a lot more Hollywood in his sensibilities, but there is that kind of let's trust the actors to do what they're going to do. Let's have a more run and gun style. Instead of spending 10 weeks on a movie, we could just spend five. And so he's got like, I don't know, five or six movies that are like unimpeachable, like perfect classic movies. And even in this like later run of his where he's kind of not doing the best work of his career, The Mule is really interesting self critique. So is uh, Cry Macho. And then even in a movie like Richard Jewell, which has its flaws, like you see those muscles flexing within the, with the bomb scene where you go, fuck. 
when this guy was on, there was nobody like him because he learned. He's had a lot of. He spent a lot of time in Hollywood. He learned and he shows it on the screen. Clint Eastwood is obviously my favorite actor turned director. Every year since 1989, the Library of Congress has selected 25 films to add to the National Film Registry. The criteria? The films must be culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Each week on You're Missing Out, we take a look at one of these films to try and get to the heart of why they were selected and why they still matter. This week, it's a film that broke the mold for how women were portrayed in contemporary film. Video podcaster Robert Bellissimo is here for 1974's A Woman Under the Influence. You know our guest today from Robert Bellissimo at The Movies, a YouTube podcast. Uh, Robert Bellissimo joins us today to talk about A Woman Under the Influence. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Excited to have you. Uh, a, Cass- a Cassavetes super fan, like, uh, two, like uh, half of this podcast. Uh, so it's good to have a, a fellow oh, Cassavetes. Oh, only half. Super freak. <laughs> Tom, you're selling me out right at the top. Um, right at the top. Right. That's right. Do you, do, you, do you not know me? I'm always going to throw you under the bus the second I can. We, we work so hard and, and, and we try so hard in the show to, to be objective because the whole idea of You're Missing Out is, is talking about these films and not if, but why they matter and keeping it that way. So I worked real hard. To, to keep my maybe not super love of the works of John Cassavetes real suppressed and prepped for this, but Tom's going to sell me out up top. Yeah, I will, I will own the fact that my relationship with John Cassavetes is definitely more uh, appreciation than enjoyment. But again, a lot of appreciation there. Just I got to get know. going. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it's... to be fair, I will say... As a guy, I I love Cassavetes. It is it's not like you're going to his movies to have a rollicking good time yeah, at exactly. the feature yeah. film exhibition. Uh, you're going to uh have your emotions just twisted and turned until you're just ready to just hit the bottle and just just <laughs> sleep for a weekend. Right. Well, you know that that reminds me of what Peter Folk said because he would often remind people, but those those movies are funny. They're funny, and it's true. I mean, I I yeah. freaking laugh my ass off at all most of them. <laughs> so maybe it takes a few view- viewings to get to that point. But I know what you mean. They're they're tough movies. I I mean I think that my challenge. I've been thinking about this a lot. Like I think my challenge with Cassavetes, and we'll get into this. And I think it's the challenge for us today. Uh, is that I've realized part of it because obviously Tom and I were were in kind of the film scene and on. I've realized that I think part of my exhaustion with, with that filmography has nothing to do with the films themselves, which I watch and go, yeah, I appreciate this and I respect this. I think it's more so much of the commentary on it, both positive and negative. Like I was reading up on this and reading both essays in praise of a woman under the influence and like Pauline Kael's excoriating oh, review. Yeah. And in both cases, I look at those and go, shut up. You're ruining this. This is a, like this. I don't think this means what you think it means. You guys are taking this way too far. Right. That that's that's an interesting that's an interesting uh, uh best point. Yeah, because it's funny because a lot of people don't talk about about him, uh, like on a scholarly uh, like you know film scholarship, but with the exception of Ray Carney, there's there's not a lot of people who have written like in depth things about him. So, but yeah, I know what you mean. The ones who have. Uh, or the ones who hated him, really, you know, like Pauline Kael really went all out with that. It's like he turns people who watch his movies into characters from his movies, where you're just either rage, just a bipolar reaction. You're either wildly effusive or ready to burn the house down with everyone inside of it, which yeah. is, uh, you know, I mean, it's a in many ways, it is a good thing. Sometimes it is annoying. And like Robert says, it would be nice to just have people kind of just write about the movies as movies and not like exercising personal demons about how John Cassavetes is, you know, the only genius that's ever lived or a right. piece of shit who hates women and, you know, should be thrown into a volcano or whatever. Right. Um, a little more objectivity, uh, or I should say, uh, yeah, objectivity and not so much uh, subjectivity. But we are here. This is our this is our show is to get into 
to put all of that bullshit aside, despite me throwing Mike under the bus, I always love doing it. <laughs> we are going to uh, get into the nitty gritty. Oh, yeah. shut up with that face of yours. No, uh, no, but it is that thing that we're talking about. I mean, like, I, my first, before I got really into film, my first exposure to John Cassavetes, the concept of Cassavetes, is, um, do you guys remember the band La Tigre? Oh, no, but is that the band who wrote a song about him? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, on their debut album, or their self-titled album, uh, What's Your Take on Cassavetes? Mm. And it's, it's a song called What's Your Take? And, and it's these two voices going back and forth, uh, debating the first thing they say is misogynist or genius, and then messiah or alcoholic, and it really is just oh, this <laughs> representation of the conversation around Cassavetes and and so much of his films where, I mean, you know, one that I'm sure we're going to touch on today, because I'm sure this is going to be a conversation about more than just a woman under the influence, but I know that, like, Husbands is perhaps the most contentious one for people who mm. watch it, and I you either come away from that going, absolutely, a really, you know, self-aware statement on toxic masculinity, or the most toxically masculine movie that was ever made. <laughs> you, it entirely comes down to how much in command you think he is of what so, he's conveying. So he's basically indie cinema Sam Peckinpah is basically what we're getting at here, which is, <laughs> uh, makes sense why I love him and Mike doesn't, because uh, <laughs> that's, I feel like, a question a lot of people ask about me when they see me. Oh, is he going to be a bad guy? Or is he, like... <laughs> Is he going to be storming the Capitol, or is he trolling Dr. Oz while he's running this, for this, Senate? Or both. Is this I Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah. And I do think that, you know, so there's a lot to, to cover with this one. I think this is, if, arguably, if, if people have seen a John Cassavetes film, it's this one. I think this one gets the most kind of recognition. It was definitely uh, the most recognized, I think, in its day. So it makes sense that this and... is the first one of his to get in. Uh, despite almost not getting released yes because yeah nobody knew what the fuck to do with this thing and it took our boy patron saint of cinema himself martin scorsese being like no 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 you show this goddamn movie or you're not getting mean streets in your fucking festival right and uh the world then changed because you know it really it got a lot of love and attention or in pauline kale's case a giant just two-hour ulcer um <laughs> But yeah, it it definitely feels like the one that if you if you've seen any Casavetti's movies, it's this. And despite it being uh, the third of his movies on three, of, he's got three on this list. It's only this and Shadows and Faces, right? Yes, on thus far he's got yeah Casavetti's in the registry three times. So, yeah, right. So if you've seen any of the ones on the registry, also it's this one. Uh, hmm. I I doubt many people are Netflix and chilling while watching. Uh, shadows or faces, so uh, <laughs> you know, not unless you're on the uh, Criterion channel, maybe there you'd be, you know, but yeah, not not for the Netflix binge watchers, you'd, you'd I don't be Criterion and chatting, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so speaking of specifically the registry, before we get more into our feelings on Cassavetes and on this film, let's talk about what the National Film Registry had to say. Here's what the Library of Congress had to say. Director John Cassavetes pioneered American independent film with his use of cinema verite in fictional narrative. By this, his seventh film as a director, Cassavetes had developed a distinct style of long takes, desultory lighting, and handheld cinematography, which were employed to convince the audience that what's on screen is really happening. Often in collaboration with his wife, actress Gina Rollins, Cassavetes created a series of stark dramas like this tale of a New York housewife slowly losing her grip on reality. As the title character, Rollins gives an Oscar-nominated performance opposite Peter Falk as her beleaguered husband. So that's what the National Film Registry had to say. Interestingly, and I, I hadn't read this statement uh, recently, it is interesting that we started this episode talking more about Cassavetes and what he represents rather than this particular film and it does seem like the registry statement as well kind of comes from a place of we have to recognize John Cassavetes films and I guess this is the one that we're going with which I think is very well, interesting I mean because this is one of the ones we have this every now and then doing the show is that there's always going to be movies where it's just obvious why they're in and Cassavetes is kind of just the patron saint of indie cinema. 
like whether you like him or not, like it's ir- it's you know undeniable that this is the guy who is synonymous with independent filmmaking, and people are you know directors and are t- still talking about him as an inspiration. They watch his movies and the passion and the hard work and the dedication of getting them onto the screen. He's he's still that guy, and indie cinema today still has you know, the visual language in a lot of ways that he really brought to the table. I mean, definitely different takes on things, but like, there's no way Sean Baker is not massively influenced by this red rocket and, you know, feels very much, you know, Florida project, all that, all his mm-hmm. stuff. It, this is just one of those ones where, yeah, like it's the second year we've seen it in the selection. They're getting a lot more broader with what they're picking. So it's like, okay, what do, what's the indie movie that we have to put in? And the most successful one this guy ever made is almost like, well, yeah, duh. So let's talk a little broader on Cassavetes. So, so Robert, you're a uh, big Cassavetes fan, uh, you know, as you've talked about on your show many times. So what is your history with John Cassavetes and how you were introduced to his work? And in particular, when did you come to A Woman Under the Influence for the first time? Well, I I initially heard about him when I was pretty young, like in my early, you know, film getting, becoming a film buff days. And I think like a lot of people, you know, you start with Martin Scorsese and then with Scorsese, Scorsese leads you down the path of everybody because he talks about all of the various masters or, or not even necessarily masters, people that you may not know that were sort of fell under the cracks. And it, it, you know, I was reading a biography on Scorsese. And of course, what came up was that Scorsese worked for Cassavetes on uh, Minnie and Mouskowitz uh, film John did in 1971. And they were, they were friends and he, he was like a mentor to, to John. And, um, when I was in acting school, uh, a friend of mine there told me that the acting in his movies are are so so real that it's like it's hard to believe that they're 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 that they're actors. It just seems like people on the street, and that really intrigued me as a young student. I'm like, okay, I, I got to see these movies. So I initially saw uh, Shadows, and now I I really love Shadows. And at the time, I liked it. I didn't like just I I wasn't blown away by it, but um. In a way, I think it's a good thing to not be blown away right away by John. So the fact that you know you you're not a um, a, a, a big fan uh, is 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 a good is a good thing. I mean, John kind of in a way hated that people. Sorry, John loved when people hated his movies in a way because he knew that that meant that he's hitting a nerve, like that they may hate it now, but then they'll never forget it in fifteen years. Uh, uh, but because they, you know, it can really, it can really produce a response in people. So, so from there, I got the Criterion Collection box set, which is the five films that has faces, A Woman Under the Influence, uh, Killing of a Chinese Bookie, Opening Night, um, and Shadows. And, uh, I was, I was only about 19 at the time. And I went through the whole box set. Of course, I got to a woman under the influence pretty quickly. I was too young to really appreciate the the entire film. But what I really got sucked into was the scene where Peter Falk comes home, finds all the, some of the kids naked at the birthday party. And, and uh, this is, this is when Jenna Rollins as Mabel begins to really crack and they, they commit her into the uh, mental hospital. And I was just, I remember I, a filmmaker friend of mine, I had him come over. I was like, you've got to see this scene. This is like the best acting in any movie ever. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I, I probably took a little more to a killing of a Chinese bookie as the film as a whole. Um, but that's the thing with, with John. I mean, you, you'll, 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 every time you see them, it's like a different experience because they're so subjective. They're so spontaneous. Uh, he doesn't give you all the answers. He doesn't spell out things for you. And that is, that is difficult or he'll put you through a scene that's very uncomfortable for like 10 minutes. Uh, you saw that a lot in husbands and faces. Um, so, you know, from there, I, I, just you know it was like <laughs> fell in love with the guy and went through his movies and every couple of years i may have gone off into other directions but i'd always go back again and again 
more than any other filmmaker, I think. To this day, he still, you know, endlessly fascinates me. And Tom, what was your uh, first exposure to uh, Cassavetes, or this film in particular, I should say, as we always talk about, you know, what, what was your first time seeing Woman Under the Influence? Uh, well, my first time with Cassavetes was a woman under the influence. He was a guy, you know, you're in the film circles and you hear Cassavetes all the time. Things weren't as easy to see back when we were in high school and college. They've gotten easier in many ways and other ways they've gotten harder. But yeah, the Criterion box set was available back when Barnes and Noble didn't realize that uh, the their 25% off coupons counted towards the Criterion sale. So you got things a lot cheaper than they wanted you to get them. <laughs> so I picked that up. And uh, that was the first one I picked because that was kind of the one that everyone was just would talk about. It was yeah. like, it's, you know, it's the pinnacle. And uh, I, I was blown away by it pretty immediately. Uh, it it really knocked me out. Um, it didn't help that it, I was kind of in a domestic situation that wasn't too dissimilar from what is happening in the movie, a very fraught, emotionally unstable <laughs> relationship. Uh, so I felt very connected to that. I felt like it felt like John, you know, from ha living through it, like, okay, John really got something here. This is a guy who is able to get to an emotional core of something. Uh, let me keep watching this guy's stuff. And I, I, I really, you know, love the guy and I respect the guy. When it's all when we all talk about Cassavetes too, we it's always about his him as a filmmaker. But he was a great actor too. You know, I got to shout out oh, that yeah. Yeah. it also led me to his work as an actor in uh, The Fury or The Killers or you know The Dirty Dozen. And um, it feels like any conversation about him as a filmmaker can't not get into his work as an actor because it feels like all of his stuff is such a reaction to how phony cinema was when he was coming up as an actor you know mm. and uh you know the guy's just endlessly fascinating and um i don't know as a guy who grew up in a very masculine world where a lot of toxically masculine guys were around it's also another thing of just having someone that early in cinema being able to really dive into these kinds of men with Without being didactic about it, which is interesting that he's so early doing it and he's not preaching to you. He's just, here it is, yeah. you know, hands out on just going, here you go. Love it or hate it. This is just the way life is. Deal with it. <laughs> it's not going to be like the end of the killers where... I die, and then Ronald Reagan shoots Lee Marvin, but then Lee Marvin shoots Ronald Reagan, and everything's just, oh, Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. It's, no. This movie ends, and it's just, oh, no, this shit's just not over when this movie's over. These yeah. people are going to be screaming at each other and making up and screaming and making up for the rest of their goddamn lives, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, it's probably not something a lot of people want to see when they go to the movies, but what are you going to do? We watch movies all the time. We like to torture ourselves sometimes. I will admit, uh, much like you, Tom, my first exposure to Cassavetes was Woman Under the Influence, but how I came to it is a little bit embarrassing. Or not how I came to it, but how I reacted to it. So <laughs> when uh, in like l the late 2000s, uh, Tom got me hooked on Empire Magazine, and Empire Magazine, at the end of 2008, start of 2009, put out a list of the what they called the 500 greatest movies of all time. I didn't have the actual magazine, but it was a list of titles online, and I told myself, I'm in college, I want to learn about these, I'm going to watch all these movies. And I see this title, A Woman Under the Influence, and I'm like, you know, I've never seen it, but I've seen stills from it, and I'm pretty sure I've seen clips of it on TV. I'm so excited because that movie looks so colorful and so zany. I'm so excited, so I put it at the top of my queue from Netflix. Because again, it looks colorful and campy and zany. And then I put it in my player, and it starts out so cinema verite and so bleak in color. And then they're all talking in English, and that's when I realized I was thinking of a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown, the El Motivar film which is 
very <laughs> different than this. So I went in prepared for a Pedro Almodovar movie, a hyper, uh, you know, soap opera thing, and very quickly was confronted with one of the bleakest films. So I was uh, not only so, uh, unprepared, I was underprepared so for this. <laughs> so you basically went in thinking you were seeing the Disney open range, but you saw the Kevin Costner open range. It's Home on the Range is the Disney film. Okay, we we just we were just talking about how it's easy to confuse those two. But yes. Um yeah, so that was my first exposure to it. But I will say this, like it was a film that I know when I saw when I saw it, I was very, very taken by it. I had the same reaction uh as as you guys to this film. I mean, obviously the Gina Rollins performance is uh is incredibly striking. And especially because when I came to this film, when I came to Women of the Influence, I was deep into diving into all of the Italian neorealists at the time, you know, because uh, I was around that time. So I was watching. I think I had I had watched Rome Open City maybe a week or two before uh, I first watched A Woman Under the Influence, you know. And I was in that phase too, as a, as a young aspiring filmmaker of like, this is what film is about, man. It's about reality, man, and depicting reality and all that. And, so I have always, even though I am not the biggest fan of, of necessarily the entire Jean Cassavetti's oeuvre, you know, as Tom sold me out up top, uh, I, I, this is always the one that I have had a respect for. Now, I do have uh, that Cassavetti's uh, Criterion box set, but even before I had that, I did buy Woman of the Influence individually because it is that one of, it makes sense why it gets in because to me, if you're gonna watch one of his films, this is the one to watch. And also, even if you're not a lover of John Cassavetes or anything like that, even if you do take a more reductive approach, like, all of his themes that he explores are in this. I read one critic who uh, was, was, you know, obviously dismissing Cassavetes, but said all of his films can be divided into two categories, uh, Men Are Bad or Gina Rollins is Having a Rough Time. Uh, which I don't think is a fair critique, but it is what if if that even if that's even if that's how you sum it up, this movie kind of covers those bases about as thoroughly as as you can. I think it's you know, it's kind of the perfect encapsulation of what that whole approach is, which I think is interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you that you um because you 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 use the word uh bleak, and I can I can see again how people would. <laughs> would feel feel that way. I mean, like I said, it is a very subjective film. And there's actually a book that came out a few years ago where it's all just interviews with Cassavetti. It's really, really good. And someone said that to him as well. And he, and he was like, well, I don't see it that way. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 you know, I mean, perhaps I'm biased because I'm perhaps I'm influenced by him. But I, I know what he means because it, at its core, it's a, it's a love story, right? It's It's a man and a woman who really love each other. They just can't quite communicate they can't quite accept certain things about each other more so him uh more so that he can't accept things about her and it's it's that it's that struggle you know what do you do i love this person but she embarrasses me when my friends are around or when my mother's around and uh uh and and it's 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 those it's the uh the, the conflict between men and women how do we, how do men and women live together how do we how do they stay together? How do they love each other? How do they hate each other? How do they have kids together? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think, you know, he was he was very influenced by Capra, right? Frank Capra. And he believed in uh, in optimistic films and as realistic as they may be sort of ex they explore very realistic themes, but they're very idealistic and they are they often end in a very hopeful you know, fashion. I mean, here they, they go to bed and they, you know, they're smiling and kissing, you know, and after this big, big fight, I mean, John believed, he really believed in, in that. And I think that's true. I mean, I think people do when they really love each other, you could be screaming one minute and laughing the next, you know, I mean, his films really show just the, 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 you know, the stickiness and the, the mess, the great mess of life and, and relationships, I feel. I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. I mean, 
especially because you know at the time it's the 70s there's a certain idea of what masculinity is and he's kind of peeling the onion back on that which is like you know peter falk is playing this guy who's like kind of a typical italian guy who's you know shooting the shit with the guys he brings him home he expects his wife to make him pasta he kind of wants his wife he loves her for who she is but he expects her to fit into place and it's yeah. just going to show how like these ideas we have of ourselves and what we expect of others you know at this time leads to a lot of mess that doesn't need to happen if this guy could just be a little more not an Italian man of the 70s. And I I just, you know, I, I agree. I They're definitely heavy movies. I don't necessarily know if I'd call them bleak because there, there are just so many funny moments to so them. So much, yeah. But it is just such a thing of, especially at the time, at least in American cinema, you don't get so much brutal honesty even if it is ultimately at the end, well, these two still, these two crazy kids still love each other. It is still a rough, a yeah. rougher ride than I think, even today, honestly, it feels like we've, you know, hit us, you know, the pendulum swung back to like an older Hollywood model of, oh, well, you can't have messy characters anymore and everything has to fall yeah. into place neatly and everyone has to be nice and even the villains can't be too villainous. It's, um, it's, it's just, you know, he's, at least in America, he was like that first guy that was just saying, no, we could just show people as people, you know, and yeah, no, definitely. I mean, they, they, people are complicated and I, 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 you know, I, I, I think, uh, I think you're right, Tom. I think, you know, now they, they would, def they would define those two characters in a certain box. Like he's the heavy and she's the victim, so to speak. And, um, and as they would have perhaps in the forties, but this is the, the fascinating thing about film history is that we expect history to just be linear and it, you know, it never really is. I mean, there are plenty of, you know, even from the, the classic Hollywood period that, that have some complicated portraits that even now really hold up. But, um, yeah, I mean, he is, um, he is just extremely em embarrassed by her and uh and doesn't know how to reach her and then he doesn't he doesn't really have it happen until um until the very very end uh, of the film and uh you know it, what's interesting is that people see this film being about mental health or they see it being about al alcoholism and those things are all in there but um it's really about it like i said it's it's really about men and women and men's need to control you know, a woman perhaps and um and, and and trying not you know i think he legitimately is trying doesn't realize doesn't know himself i mean his characters are blue collar often or they're middle you know they're lower to middle class and they're not articulate i mean i, I think one of the reasons why this film was so successful is that these characters actually often say what they mean but when when they say what they mean, they're very um, uh, coming from a place of ignorance. But at least it makes sense. Like Nick and Mabel both say what they mean, whereas in Faces they don't. Husbands they don't. Uh, he, the characters in those movies are much more lost. And there's so many movies where the obstacles that characters face, the the the, the people uh, very much know how to handle those obstacles. And these characters don't. I mean, these are. Just, I mean, his films, in a way, all of them are like these people sleepwalking through life, and they get hit with something that they can't handle. And um, in a lot of in a lot of his movies, I find that very funny. I mean, especially Nick. You know, he's alone with these kids, and he's drinking, giving them beer, and he's bringing them, taking them out of school, bringing them to the beach. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's insane. I mean, who the hell would do that? Uh, but. You know, I mean, every like I said, every time you, I take to them in such different ways every time. That's just the real beauty of art. And John was certainly an artist in, in my books. Well, that that is the thing that I think is fascinating about him and the reception to his films is that, and I, I said this up top, that I, I think that my struggle with Cassavetes is less to do with his films and more the discourse around him, because I think that 
you know, um, Robert, you're right about how you find something new in it every time. They're hard to put into any kind of category. Anybody you read trying to tell you what this movie is about, it feels reductive. And yeah. then you see so yeah. many people who I was reading a, a piece um, that was published in the Harvard Crimson uh, that Irene Larcher did. Uh, Irene was responding to Pauline Kael's criticisms and saying, because Pauline Kael, when she reviews this film, decides to make her entire review viewing this movie as an expression of the theories of this particular psychologist of the time, uh, this guy R.D. Lang, who I don't mean to be too reductive, but R.D. Lang was one of this, uh, you know, to, to, to over oversimplify it, part of this movement of people in like the 70s with that kind of no, nah, man, you're not crazy. It's society that's crazy. Dig, man. Mm -hmm. Schizophrenia is not a thing. You know, like one of these things that sounds now like one of those guys going, dump your medication in the toilet, man. You don't need it. Like that type of cat. Cassavetes rejects that label. Yeah. And it's like, no, it's not about that. It's not about gender. It's not about that. But then Irene Larcher, even trying to dispute that in her own piece, says, this is where Cassavetes loses me because I think this film is clearly about gender roles. And he says it's not. And it's. I think it's a little like, the thing about Cassavetes that I think is is interesting and about this film in particular it's interesting is it's 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 not a Tennessee Williams play. It's not something where you can kind of go this is the theme. It's like a Pollock painting. It's like a, a piece of modern art where you look at it and you feel something and you get something from it. But at the same time any attempt to kind of take this is what it said to me this time and make it into this is what the movie's about feels false. You know, I, I somebody could walk out of this movie feeling like, oh my God, these two people are in a toxic relationship and it's the worst thing for them and Gina Rollins is not getting the help she needs. And that's as valid a takeaway as going, this is a love story about two people that are going to make it work despite the odds. Right. I don't think that there's necessarily... Either of those is invalid, regardless of what I feel watching it in a particular time. I think that it's, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it uh, like I said, like a Pollock painting or like another piece of modern, he kind of just presents events yeah, and just goes, all right, take from this what you're going to take, which I think makes this such a compelling viewing. Yeah, well, they don't, I mean, his films don't have static meanings. And I think part of the reason why critics and scholars have a hard time with them is because it's hard to write a paper on on a movie like this because you feel that you have to come in with some kind of strong message or point of view, all the things that you said. And there's nothing, you know, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with with people writing about films that way, but uh, John's films, they're they're like it's like you you said, Mike. I mean, they people could say, "Oh my God, this is about a toxic marriage, Jesus," or someone can walk out and say, "Oh my, that's so beautiful." And uh, both are, 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 you know, perhaps uh, valid in, in a lot of ways. And I think Ray Carney hadn't really hit the nail on the head when he writes about his films. He, he writes not so much in saying, well, Nick did this because of this motivation. He says, you know, it's more like he would show a scene to a class and he would say, why do you think Nick is doing such and such, the who Peter Falk plays? And someone will, will give an answer, someone else will give, uh, a, a different answer, a third answer, and he'll say it's actually all of those things. In other words, those are all possible. And life is like that too. Like if I go down the street and see someone uh, smack uh, their child in the face and then turn the corner and be so romantic with their girlfriend, uh, you know, on, on the one hand, I might say this person is awful, and then and then see them another side of them and say, oh, well, wait a minute. Aren't you awful? Well, actually, he is awful, but maybe he's also romantic. You know, it's not. You know, people are are not. You're not. No one has any kind of static um, identity, and 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 relationships are certainly not just. Oh, we love. You know. Oh, yes, they have a great marriage. Boom. And I think people have a hard time with that in in life in general. I think we we crave meanings and we crave not know we crave knowing things and john was all about just living in the stream you know living that stream and you know you don't know where the stream in life is going right and just just you have to just 
be open to the moment. And I think that's why his films are also so real because he was just capturing what was right there in front of him. And they just seem like accidents and obviously they're not, but um, you know, everyone was just had their eyes on what was going on. That that's the crew. That's the, 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 the lighting, the people doing the lighting, the sound, uh, everything. And, and that's why the editors, everyone is what's the most important moment in this scene to focus on and how, and that will inform the editing and the everything. And, um, you know, it's very instinctive filmmaking, I suppose, is a way to look at it. And, you know, everybody wants uh, meaning in their movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think everybody wants <clears throat> uh, their characters to be idols, some somebody to look up to. They want uh, a kind of sanitized view of humanity. Like right. I said, the characters, people in real life are messy. They are a bundle of contradictions. And people don't want to see that in movies because people want to be uh coddled and told oh no you're you're actually good exactly if you re- yeah. if you Reassured. if you feel like yeah if you feel like you're this character that means you're a good person because this mm-hmm. character is a good person where this movie doesn't do that it doesn't demean anybody or make anyone look bad but it doesn't make anyone look like saints because uh you know we keep talking about peter falk's role in this but it's like general Rowan's character there is something wrong with her it's not like he's re- he's not wrong in saying like something's wrong with mabel but he's a a fucking asshole about it because he yeah. doesn't know how, what to do yeah. yeah at the time yeah. like a guy like that wouldn't know what to do yeah but there is something wrong this isn't a case of some wilting flower learning to become a real woman no she's she's got something wrong and that's not something people want to see they want to see the woman overcoming the man or the man overcoming the woman yeah. and it's that beautiful messiness that makes it so it helps add to that mosaic like Pollock like quality of this movie where or all of his movies where you just go, I I don't know where I fall on these people, but I I relate to this in many ways. I respect what this guy did, and it's not the easy answer machine. He is not the easy answer machine. It's it's and I'm glad you brought that up time with, with Rollins because I think that you know, when I go to, to log this film on Letterboxd, you know, for watching it, you see reviews, which again, they're so reductive in terms of like, you'll see people talking about this and, and saying like, you know, it, this movie's really just about a, a woman who's, she's not unwell, she's just quirky. And I'm like, I think though, I think we're definitely, be, like the, the party scene is the epitome of, I think even if you want to watch all of the stuff prior to that, where she's doing the the strange ticks with her with her fist and her lip and all of that, and also the fact that she brings another man home and doesn't remember that it's not her husband. Right, Even if right. you want to take all of that, which <laughs> should be a red flag, there, the party scene is so great because it's the fr- she doesn't necessarily. I mean, yes, the kids are running around naked, which is you know a visceral thing, but it's not like she has a scene where she's telling the kids to play with knives per se. But you do understand why the other father is yeah. looking at it like, I this is this is like a a hair away from going off the rails in a bad fucking way. And the thing that I think is interesting about Falk is the first time I watched this, I know that my takeaway from it was this is a movie about a woman who needs help and nobody knows how to give it to her. But this time, you know, and maybe it's getting older, or maybe it's you know situations I've been in. I don't relate to the Falk character in his, you know, I'm I'm certainly not a blue collar, uh, you know, rough and tumble kind of guy or nothing like that. But I do understand now a, a little more the what I call the foxhole mentality, which is that, you know, I think that in our in our uh, I hate to sound like an old man, but in our kind of twitterized, tumblerized world of how we talk about how to deal with things, we only focus on like well, if this person's having a tough time, you need to give them a hug and pat their hair and go shush, 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 shush. But there's the foxhole mentality, I think, in these situations, which is even though he's not approaching it right, I do get that when she's having these moments, his approach is like, look, we got to deal with the practical shit right now, and then we can deal with the emotions later. Like, if you cut your hand open and you're bleeding, I'm going to shove it under the sink and put a Band-Aid on it, and then we can deal with how you're feeling. But holy shit, you know, like, now I watch it and it's a little more like it's it, it plays less like this man doesn't understand the struggling woman and it plays more like 
okay, she set the house on fire, and he's busy tossing buckets of water and saying, we can deal with why you lit a match later. Not saying that's the right approach or anything like that, but I do think that that's a totally different perspective on this character this time around. And the film hasn't changed at all, just I've changed. And I think that that's what you guys are saying about the, the different approaches one can have to this. Well, that's why it's so easy. It's why that character, despite being so aggressive and wrong in how he handles the situation, is still relatable because it's all because he does love her and he's trying. He just, he, he's like, we've got these, we have it, children. We have lives in our care. I love you. I don't know what to do. I'm just <laughs> really, really trying. And I, I don't know. I feel like that's a very relatable thing. You know, sometimes yeah. we just get into situations where we just don't know what to do, but we're just trying our damnedest to survive and make sure our loved ones survive, even if we come off looking like fucking dicks about it, which he does. That's the really amazing balancing act of the movie. He's an asshole, but he's not an asshole because he's malicious. He's an asshole because he's ignorant. He doesn't know what to do. Exactly. This is the yeah. woman he loves and he wants to make things better, but he just doesn't know what to do while this woman is cavorting around, not realizing other men are not her husband while she's letting the kids run, run wild. All this crazy shit she does. While she's getting in the faces of every guy at the dinner table when they come home for breakfast, it's he, I love that he yeah. just it's yeah like he just doesn't know what to do yeah and it's again in a more simplified movie he's just a bad guy who's right. just abusive to his wife and he doesn't really love her she's just an item but no she's or it's... he's just desperate to try and save her that he's you know that he's. The one struggling there, you know, uh, against her, her illness. That's the other alternative, and this film doesn't do either. Yeah. This movie and Cassavetes is not the easy answer machine. This right. is... And, it, it, and, and, you know, Robert's right. It, is, it, I, it feels hard to... I can't imagine being someone having to write an article or an essay, even with an unlimited fucking word count at your disposal, trying to wrangle like a cohesive like single thought about this movie because it is just as intimate and small scale as it is it is like an epic mosaic of emotions and themes and just feelings it's just i mean fuck i mean listen pauline kale can eat shit but like i i don't necessarily <laughs> blame her for not knowing how to handle this movie because it's a fucking messy movie especially for someone as big a dipshit as she was you know <laughs> Listen, she's dead. She can't come after me. And even if she did, I could take her. <laughs> only, yeah, only, uh, only in your dreams, I suppose. Um, uh, yeah, God, no, she is going to haunt me tonight. Yeah, she'll haunt you. <laughs> Pauline no. Kale is Tom's Freddy Krueger. Yeah, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to wake up in a bathroom, and I'm just going to hear someone getting swirly, and I'm going to see Pauline Kale walking out after she just swirly David Lean and saying, "I'm coming for you next." <laughs> oh asshole. God. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it this uh, something that is is coming to mind here is like uh, one of er, uh, I'm not sure I'm I'm not sure if I, I'm sure actually I'm sure both of you saw it. Uh, one of his early studio films that he really didn't like is uh, a, um, a Child Is Waiting, which they mm -hmm. you know they they Stanley the Judy Kramer. Garland one, right? Sorry, it's Judy Garland's in that one, right? Yeah, Judy Garland and yes. Stanley Kramer uh, re-edited it and re-edit took it away from him and re-edited it and and you know it's a, that's a that's another story uh but you know john something that john really points out you know that film being about you know children who have mental dis all sorts of mental disabilities and you know he he really felt that you know it was it was society looks at those people as being quote unquote problematic and we need to coddle them because they don't know how to act in society and he felt that actually we're the ones who are dopes, you know, because, well, what, what is wrong with the fact, like, of someone like Mabel, who's, like, really kooky, and, and yet that, that behavior is just not acceptable. And I, you know, the, John would often say, you know, that he's almost not crazy. In other words, you just have to, you just have to accept that everyone actually is pretty nutty. 
And all this behavior we we do in society is often learned behavior in order to survive. And so a guy like Nick is, you know, he's conservative. He's, as he says, you know, especially at that scene towards the end when he throws a party for her, her, her coming back from a mental hospital. I mean, that's the, 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 again, that's where the comedy comes in. And of course, you know, as she starts to be her old self, and he's like, hey, normal conversation. How are you? Hello. And see, that's how he he gets embarrassed. He's insecure and he hates if anyone does anything outside of the quote unquote conventional uh, behavior. And I think you're you're right. I mean, yeah, Mike, there is something, you know, and really what's wrong with her is doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, you know, she may be an alcoholic. I mean, that's certainly probably the most suggested. Uh, if she did doesn't recognize that guy she you know slept with and she thinks it's it's Nick you know is that because of, of from all the alcohol <laughs> is that from a mental illness you don't really know uh, but a lot of I I really but again it's ambiguous but I think a lot of the reason why she's kind of going insane is because of his need to really really control her uh, but that's just the way I see it someone else may say well she has a problem. And he doesn't know how to deal with it. But I think her problems really come for the fact that, you know, his need to for her to behave in a certain way. And and, you know, people can people can look at it in all kinds of all kinds of different points of views, well, really. I think that's the advantage that this film has and why it endures is, you know, when we talk about mental health on film, very little of it endures uh because obviously how we as a society approach this topic shifts uh back and forth back and forth there's so many different things and so many different kind of uh questions that we have in society when it's uh matters of autonomy and consent and consciousness that we oscillate back and forth on constantly right on in so many different ways and i do think that films that are more direct about it or art that is more direct about it in any way ages terribly right like you know i was thinking about when i was watching this i was thinking about garden state you know the zach braff film from 2004 because at the time garden state came out we were real heavy into that whole prozac nation conversation nationally and at the time when garden state ends with you know or has that scene where zach braff's confronting his dad and being like dad you gave me drugs you gave me antidepressants so that i don't know how to feel anything at the time, that felt profound, but now we're in a much different conversation mm, around mm, mental health, right, right. where we are telling people there shouldn't be a stigma around medication, and you watch that scene now and go, this feels insane that anyone said this, and then in 2012, like, Silver Linings Playbook goes out of its way to be a movie about, like, no, Bradley Cooper, it's good to take your medication, that's a good thing, and you can right. see, like, what the attitude was at the time, whereas... When I read Kale's review and she's talking about Artie Lang, or Lang, L-A-I-N-G is the name, and this philosophy, this approach of like, you know, this, well, it's actually, you know, it's society's the problem, man, you're not the problem. Like, you know, it's society's rules, which is this thing that we had in the 70s. The 70s and art in the 70s is all about like, hey, man, why do we have these rules? Let's dismantle them all. It shouldn't matter. And then you watch a lot of art from the 70s and the rules they say we should dismantle and go, oh, no, because you can see how maybe in 1979, uh, a movie like, you know, to take it in a different direction. Let's just say in 1979, Manhattan comes out and everybody goes, dig, man, you get it. There should be no rules. And now we watch it and go, no, there should have been a rule here. Mm. No, that one was right. This, in its ambiguity, benefits so much because no matter where the public conversation is around mental health and whether we're overdiagnosing or underdiagnosing or or it does this person need help or is she just you know quirky or whatever this film never passes judgment maybe Cassavetes yeah. himself had his attitudes on that and reading interviews with him about it where he does kind of deflect certain criticisms or certain observations go well it's not about that it's about this yeah, yeah actually hurts more than it helps in some cases in terms of like this film manages to exist and and escape any kind of timeliness in a way or being bound by its era because no matter when you watch it in the 70s 80s 90s it still 
can reflect mm. what we're dealing with. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's that. I think that's a really great observation. And that, now, I mean, I again, I, I don't mean to say that this film is about mental health, but that what you just said is now making me think about films from the beginning of cinema to now about mental health. And yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, I can't think of too, too many, like something like Lilith, for example, uh, which I recently saw again. And, you know, they're like, it's a really good movie, but some of the, certainly some of the things about mental health in that are certainly dated. Yeah. That's a good point. That's that, that's a, that's a, you know, a, a something to explore within itself. I think that's a, that's a good topic right there. So yeah, that's true. I mean, because, you know, you can't nail this down. Right. So, we can't say, I mean, oh, that doesn't hold up because it certainly does. I mean, because it's again, it's the movie never says nothing's wrong with her. It's his fault, blah, blah, blah. It's it's saying something's wrong, but it does say again, like maybe we were wrong. This was the wrong path for her in the end, you know, because in the end she gets electroshocked and she comes yeah. back like a shell of herself and everything. And it's it's like, OK, they're like, by not specifying anything. It just adds to that again like what we're saying it's not telling you everything it's not handing everything out to you on an easy platter yeah. it's just okay they got her help quote unquote but it's the help that's not actually help it's just trying to put a band-aid on a bullet wound yeah, yeah. and you, you gotta think like i don't know like we, we're just talking and so many thoughts that this movie again brings out in you nick had to have fallen in love with her at a certain point you know so this stuff must not have been as bad of a problem but when you get married and he starts being more controlling it probably gets worse maybe it does maybe it doesn't we don't know if it's his fault or if it's just the natural course of aging with the mental illness uh it, it feels like it's not an accident that the title of the movie itself could be interpreted in multiple ways a woman under the influence yeah, is she exactly. drunk is she yeah. is she under the influence of his controlling hand yeah is she yeah. the under, under the influence of her own you know broken mind or whatever it's uh, this it's just I, like I like I I don't have again. There's just I don't have the words to really say of just how perfectly ambiguous this movie is. Which again gets to a thing I I love to say, which is the more specific you are, the more the broader you can be. And he's just focused on the specifics of these two and not the world exactly or detailing yeah. every little like mental health thing we're going yeah. through in 1974 or whatever it's just here's these two people right now at this crossroads yeah let's just see it we don't do anything else we it, they barely leave the house i mean they go to the beach we see nick <laughs> at work but it's yeah. barely it's pretty much because he wrote it as a play it's, and jenna exactly. rollins had to say yeah. I'm not doing this every day. This will actually drive me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eight shows a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, do yeah. I'm not doing this twice on fucking Sundays. Get, get away from me. Yeah. Um, it's, it just has that great theatrical without being theatrical feel. It's just here we are in the moment. Just live in the moment. I want to jump on one thing you brought up, Tom, because you mentioned the electroshock and, and one thing I found fascinating on this viewing, I think the first time I watched it, uh, you know, they mentioned electroshock, and because of how we you know, think of electroshock therapy now, and because of how it is depicted in virtually every other kind of media, we immediately go, oh, that's a bad thing. Now, to be clear, this is not, I'm not going to have a pro-electroshock therapy take on here or anything. But what I'm I do mean is no, no. Uh, this I, this is a pro electroshock therapy <laughs> podcast. We're putting that out right no, no, now. No, 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 no. This uh, is a pro the electroshock therapy scene in Return to Oz that scarred oh, a generation. We're all oh, in on that. We're all for that. We're all pro electro yeah, falling into a bat of electric fields. <laughs> so anyway, uh, no. But the thing I find interesting is, you know, Tom, you said it as in like, well, you know, she gets electroshock therapy. That's not the help she needed. What I love this time around is that the film is not even openly critical of electroshock therapy. The film is not even openly... It, it does not treat new Gina Rollins when she comes back the way that, like, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest treats yeah. lobotomized Murph. Instead, the real problem and the real conflict is not even the electroshock itself. It's that she comes back and she is sedated and docile and whatever, and she's gone through everything she had to go through to now be fixed and now be quiet and polite and have all her tics taken away. And the problem is not that her tics were taken away. It's that now 
all of these people, her dad, her mom, and particularly Peter Falk, are going, come on, Mabel, where's the old Mabel? <laughs> Be the old Mabel. Do yeah. the th- he he take Peter Falk takes her to the stairs and goes, do the nah, do the do the ticks, do the this, do the that, be Mabel. And that's where the conflict comes from. And that's what really hit me this time is that it's not even about the electroshock therapy itself. It's about her kind of going, No, hang on. I went through all of this shit. I went through all of this to learn how to be and make myself this thing that you said I had to be. And now that I did it, you're telling me to do all of the things that I went through all of this to not do. You know, it's, it's, it's as though, you know, it's like a much more brutal version of sending somebody, somebody to a uh, charm school for six years, you know, at, you know, it's like, it's like if at the end of My Fair Lady, uh, they told Eliza Doolittle, come on, talk Cockney again. It's like, no, I just went through this whole thing. Why are you doing this to me? Right. It's like a form right. of torture, you know, which I, that's, I think what's so compelling about that, that even the film is not even necessarily a criticism of therapy or any other kind of treatment. It's more just the ultimate conflict is Gina Rollins feeling like, I don't know what you people want from me. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, the whole film people are, when I watched it uh, on my last viewing again, I, I really realized how often people tell her that she's crazy. So, and how much that affects her, her um, self-esteem to the point where she asks her kids, which is <laughs> kind of funny at the same time. Like, do you guys think I'm nutty? Do you guys think I'm sort of a crazy mother? Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, from, from the very first scene after the spaghetti breakfast scene, when all the guys leave and then she says to them, I'll be whatever you want me to be. And then when she, when she does that, okay, I guess I just won't talk after coming home from the hospital and she's sedated. And then he's like, no, 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 go back to being the way you were. And then she does go back to being the way she was. You know, she, she mentions that that one friend of theirs has a big ass now. And she's, she's doing some weird little sketch with a, her ribbon and little jokes and stuff. And then he's like, gets mad about that. So Nothing satisfies him, and that is ultimately why she goes and tries to kill. You know, she takes the razor blade, right? Um, which is a running theme in a lot of his movies. You see women uh, taking razor blades and two late blues and Minnie and Mouskowitz because they're being told to 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 not be who they are. And uh, John really understood that. I mean, Jenna Rowland said that he understood a, a lot about women. She doesn't understand how he knew. <laughs> so much about women but he really liked women and he just really he as he said he did he doesn't know how the way society is set up he doesn't know how women don't go crazy you know because it's just everything is forcing them particularly you know we're talking pre-70s um when you know when when women were really sort of you know hey put in your place and they didn't have the, the rights you know but much rights he didn't understand how they didn't go crazy and and that's what led to to this film but you saw that in a lot of his movies like there there was this element of women just going and getting that razor blade and you know trying to kill themselves because of what what the guy's doing what whatever their man and their life is doing to them so it's pretty it's pretty interesting yeah i think you know you mentioned too late blues by the way that is a that is a movie that uh so i i watched uh the bulk of cassavetes filmography in prep for this which oh Tom, yeah, Tom's. Oh, yeah. Uh, so when I got to Too Late Blues, and you see the reviews on, like, you know, of people going, like, well, it's the studio held John back from doing uh, what John Cassavetes would have fully done in this movie. And I said, thank God. Uh, because watching Too Late Blues and imagining what the unfiltered John Cassavetes does with that movie, I'm like, oh, I would have drank bleach. This movie would have been so hard to get through <laughs> if he had had no restraints that I would have walked out like I had I would have had a thousand yard stare by the end of it I would have been Rambo yelling they drew first blood you know? well, they, well they didn't change too much I mean the big thing with that film was that you know because John liked to rewrite and stop yeah. and, and of course when you're working with a studio they were like no 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 no, no. we're not stopping you're not rewriting we're, we're yeah. following what we were doing and uh, the the there was only a couple things cut, so it wasn't that 
I mean, then again, if he had approached it as he approached this film, Woman Under the Influence, where he's it's just his own money, he can do what he wants. I'm sure it would have been different. But That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that you know there was only a couple of things that were cut really. So uh, I like that movie. I mean, I know it, again, it's people kind of put down his studio films, uh, and because he did, and yeah, they're not as good as his independent ones. But they're I quite like Too no, Late. I Blues. I, yeah. I like Too Late Blues, and yeah. weirdly, I hate that Bobby Darren got panned for that movie because I think he's good. In I that. thought he was great in that. I think he's, I think yeah, he's good. Yeah, he was. He was a friend of of John's. He was in John's acting class, and you can see him um, in Shadows. He's in Shadows. Mm-hmm. He's like a background performer in Shadows. You see him in there. One thing I wanted to single out is he's only in it for like a couple minutes, but Fred Draper showing oh, yeah. up as Mabel's father. <laughs> uh, Fred Draper was also, right. he was, if people have seen Faces, he's in like the first scene or so of Faces. Uh, also, he was in like six episodes of Columbo with Peter Falk. Yeah. So <laughs> they all had a relationship, but Fred Draper showing up in this movie is such a master stroke because you think you've spent so much time with Mabel, you spent so much time with Nick, and you're like, I think I got a beat on their relationship and what their whole thing is. And then Fred Draper shows up for one scene as Mabel's dad, and his tics and mannerisms and approach to her is so fucking weird that all of a sudden, your entire perspective on Mabel and everything shifts because you just... His behavior, like, this is a whole can of worms. And you've gone the whole rest of this movie looking at Mabel and kind of being like, well, if she's messed up, maybe it's because of Nick, or maybe it's because this, maybe it's because that. And then it isn't until Fred Draper appears where you go, oh, this shit could have started way earlier. Like, there's, what is their history? What's their vibe? You know, Tom said something about, um, well, Nick and her must have fallen in love at some point. And it's like, when you see the way that Fred Draper approaches her and, the fa- and you know, her parents approach her and all that, you kind of go, is this something that escalated? Was she like this when they met and Nick just thought it was endearing and now it's become hard to deal with? Is this something where I think, you know, when you're in a relationship or things like that, you know, you get older and you realize, oh, there's shit we probably should have dealt with earlier on and now it's festered too much. Is that what that is in this? It just, that whole thing adds a whole other layer to this that I think isn't there for most of them, but I think is really compelling. So I wanted to, I wanted to shout out Fred Draper's uh, yeah. quick appearance in this. Yeah, no, I I quite I quite like him uh, in this, and I and I like that I like the way he responds. When Nick is like telling him to sit down, and then he just keeps saying, "I'm not in the mood for spaghetti. I gotta go." And he's talking about spaghetti, but really, what he's saying is, "Nick, shut up and don't tell me what to do." You know, yeah. but he's just talking. I mean, that's just the genius of of Cassavetes that these characters are saying one thing, but they really mean. <laughs> something else and uh yeah that's a that's a i had it i to be honest i hadn't really given a lot of thought to the parents her parents in this film i mean the the mother that's his real mother uh her yeah. sorry her real mother jenna rollins and and cassavetti's real mother is also nick's mother in this um i always just saw him as like the concerned father you know and she's telling him to stand up and sit down at the dinner table and he's like honey i don't know what you want me to do um, I hadn't, yeah, but you know, it's interesting. You could really go down a rabbit hole with their history and possibilities of the relationship from well before the film starts. I mean, that's, again, that's the beauty of this movie. It's, it just is so well informed and so rich and you feel like, you know, the story didn't just start when the movie starts, that this is something that's been going on and that it's going to keep going on when it ends and whatever we just popped in for this, you know two hours over a six month span period of their life. And, um, right. Uh, I feel like honestly, the only thing I really think I just want to end on is Jenna Rollins gives like the best performance ever in this movie. Oh yeah. yeah. Like we're, we're spending so much time on Cassavetes and like rightly so, like, I mean, he directed it and, and all that, but like she's and Peter, look, Peter Falk's great casting Peter Falk in like a, as a leading role in a movie is one of those things you only had happen in the seventies. Cause listen, love the guy. He's a weird looking fucking dude. And he's got a weird voice. He's a short little cockeyed, weird little man. I wish we still saw those kind of people on screen, but we sadly don't. <laughs> but like, that's the thing is like, Again, another thing Cassavetes was one of the early guys with. Was, in fairness, Tom, as we know, as Vim Vendors told us, Peter Falk is an angel. So, you know, Peter never Falk forget, is an angel. Is a, um, 
it's one thing to do it in shadows and faces when it's really super low budget stuff, but to like start gr- growing in scale, like Minnie and Moskovitz, like Seymour Cassell, another weird looking man. He looks like a fish with a ponytail in that movie. <laughs> um, uh, it's it's just, but like Peter Falk's great, but Jenna Rollins, it's 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 it it, it felt like what six years ago when L came out and we saw what Isabel Huppert. <laughs> What is yeah? What Isabel Huppert did in L, and we just went, oh, so this is like the peak of of acting for like what <laughs> another fifty years or so, like until someone else gives another actress their Mabel Longetti or their L. Like, is this just this is just it? And this is like what 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 did other actors do when they see, see, saw this? Did they just like was this like when you were at Eurovision and ABBA performed? <laughs> Well, I was I, I want you to know, Tom, I was gonna make a joke before we talked Oscars that since we are a bunch of film nerds gathered on mic, we have to spend a solid five minutes talking about how good Gina Rollins is in this movie. Uh so I was gonna make sure we covered that because it is yeah. undeniably one of the greatest film performances oh, yeah. of all time. Yeah, because because uh, cause, uh, you know, Falk is great, but without her performance, this movie would fall into the traditional trappings she might not be as you know human and messy and a a lesser actress or even an actress of equal stature who just doesn't have the wavelength connection that she did with john her husband uh it just wouldn't be the same and it's just it's just an it's just out of control it's fucking insane how great this performance is i i i know i shouldn't be probably saying insane in relation to a movie about a woman (laughs) literally going fucking nuts but uh yeah i mean she's just fucking great it's like what if even if this movie wasn't like inducted for its status in independent cinema you just look at her performance and go oh yeah no yeah we need to get this preserved for the rest of time because fucking look at this shit this is insane i'm doing it again i know the the what's what's also extraordinary about not uh about the performances she gave i mean everybody but her her more so because she's in pretty much all of them is particularly the independent ones like a film like this she they well no no one would have known if anyone would even have seen this at the time i mean she's given yeah. this performance not getting paid not knowing whether this is even going to come out i mean cassavetti self distributed this movie when a time when no one did that no one wanted to fund it no one wanted to see it they they had to literally go into theater after theater to self distribute it so She's giving this performance that you, she doesn't even know if this is going to come out. Uh, but they do it for their art because they they felt that something needed to be explored and said, and that's really that's that's really extremely admirable. Uh, and and that's that was really why they wanted to do it. But yeah, she she hits everything. I mean, people talk about the intensity, but the humor too. I mean, she's so funny in this. There's the party scene with the kids and she's acting out the Swan Lake and she's trying to get the other guy to clap and, 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 and have a good time. Cause he's so reserved. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so funny and, and so heartbreaking at the same time. I mean, she's just, you know, I, I interviewed someone who worked with her. She was in love streams, Leslie hope, the uh, actor director. She, you might may know her from 24. She was Kiefer Sutherland's life wife on 24 she was in uh talk radio with uh oh, okay, own yeah. film um i interviewed her because she's from toronto and she she said she doesn't know how you know she's like i know people say meryl streep is the queen of hollywood nothing against meryl streep but i mean come on <laughs> jenna i mean jenna is just should be really the queen <laughs> the queen I mean, of that of that town especially because this film this film is so the f- previous film uh, Minnie Moskowitz in that she is still uh you know when we first meet her and and in faces and in everything else you know one thing that you notice in any of those movies faces in it is and I don't mean this to be objectifying in any way at all but she's she's gorgeous right she's oh, yeah. immediately striking yeah. what's so remarkable I think about from the first minute we see her in this movie is how unadorned she is from the start it is so willing to make her not look because one thing i hate is you know when we talk about great acting performances and they're like well they they made this actress look so ugly and they made her so vulnerable 
while people could describe this as a vulnerable performance, what I think is so interesting is that it is not vulnerable in the way that so many movies have an actress or an actor be vulnerable in a sympathetic manner. This is just unvarnished. This is un- unmade up. You know, from the minute you see her, it's just messy and chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. And that nothing, I mean, we can watch it and you can certainly be moved by her doing the Swan Lake dance or her breakdown or anything like that. But not a single iota of the performance she is giving is done toward the audience, is done to win the audience's sympathies. She does not care whether you come away from this movie going, well, Mabel is, you know, uh, uh, a saint who should be preserved, or whether you come away from this movie going, Mabel should be locked away for a million years. It's not done with any intention to win sympathy or to evoke anything other than this is what I feel this character would do. This is how ugly it's going to get. This is how unsettling it's going to get. This is how disjointed it's going to be. And I think that that is just... That there is a courage to that kind of performing that you don't see in, I think, you see in very few performers, and she deserves every ounce of praise for that. Oh, yeah, it's just absolutely. honesty. It's that's that's the simple way of putting it. It's just honesty, you know, and it's it's great. I mean, really, she she's the queen. She's she's on Mount Rushmore for sure. Uh, so to wrap this up, like we always do, we're talking about the Academy Awards. Tom. How did a woman under the influence do at the Academy Awards? How do you think it did? What do you think it got recognized for? Probably director, actress, and screenplay. It probably won zero. So you are so close. It did not get nominated for Best Picture. The Best Picture nominees that year were Chinatown, The Conversation, Lenny, The Towering Inferno, and the winner, The Godfather Part Two. Uh, worth wow. noting for everyone listening, Chinatown, The Conversation, and The Godfather Part 2 are also all in the registry. We'll be talking about Chinatown next season. Uh, and it was is bad. <laughs> it was nominated for Best Director. Cassavetes did get a nomination for Best Director, uh, but lost to Francis Ford Coppola for The Godfather Part 2. It's an interesting year because even though Towering Inferno and The Conversation are up for Best Picture, the last two best director slots go to Cassavetes and also Francois Truffaut for Day for Night. Oh. Again, just hell of a lineup. Uh, and the only other nomination it received, it did not get a screenplay nomination, but Jenna Rollins was nominated for Best Actress. However, you know, we started this off with Robert talking about uh, Cassavetes' relationship with Martin Scorsese. Rollins loses to Ellen Burstyn for yeah. Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Right. Uh, I also want to point out, even though we may all be like, oh, Rollins should have won for sure, and that's certainly where I'm at. Talk about Murderer's Row, the best actress lineup this year. Ellen Burstyn wins. Jenna Rollins for Woman Under the Influence. Valerie Perrine for Lenny. Faye Dunaway in Chinatown. And Diane Carroll for Claudine. Just just a goddamn Murderer's Row in that category. Marty, you fuck. (laughs) But like, (laughs) it's this weird thing where it's like, any one of those performances you look at and on their own isolated, if somebody told you that won the Oscar, you'd go, yes. But knowing that that Jenna Rollins performance is in there somehow feels right for that being what should win over four other incredible performances. It's such an interesting thing. There's a story there. there apparently there was a post Oscar party that cast that Tim Carey threw for Cassavetes and the, the woman under the influence team. Scorsese showed up feeling terrible that hit that a <laughs> that a movie of his a performance will beat something of Cassavetes and I can't remember how Cassavetes responded and I shouldn't say it because I don't know for sure but I, I'm guessing uh, it, he laughed or something I mean he really didn't care about awards and all that kind of stuff um, but I I I didn't know I always thought it was nominated for best picture I didn't know that the Towering Inferno got a best that's, picture no yeah. oh my god i mean that's a fun you know whatever 70s i i movie. go back to those disaster movies all disaster, the time that's, that's what the word yeah. i'm looking for because disaster any movies. yeah the Irwin allen thinks because anytime you see one of those like film twitter people be very like 
man, I wish we were back in the 70s. That's when movies were good. I'm like, yeah, bro, yeah. look at the box office. You will not believe that's, that's true. some of the things that were a big deal. Like, everyone forgets that Earthquake was a huge yeah. moneymaker. Yeah. And you, you know, know what? Know. Towering Inferno probably finishes in fourth in the best picture race, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, Tom, I'm sorry. Tom, do you have thoughts on the movie Lenny? That's never come yeah. up on the show before. Have I, I talked Lenny. about Lenny on the show before? Tom, multiple times and twice you used the exact phrasing, Lenny? That movie sucks. Oh, that is exactly it on two different episodes. <laughs> listen, you made the joke. Every time you tell me about something I said on the show, I look like I'm saying in my head, yeah, that guy's got a good point. Well, you know what? I got a good point. That movie sucks. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but a woman of the influence certainly does not. Uh, we're so glad, no. Robert, that you could join us for yeah, this. Yeah, man. Thank you. Uh, this was an oh, amazing my conversation. Pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Anytime. Thanks so much. Did you have anything you wanted to plug? Did you want to talk a bit about Robert Felicia about the movies? Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing uh, for the folks listening? Sure. So it's a YouTube video podcast. There also is an audio version of the uh, YouTube channel, which you can find on any uh, podcast platform. But YouTube is where uh, all the episodes are. And it's a, a video. It's, it's, it has evolved since it started. Um, in the summer of 2020, I originally had a co-host, uh, and after about 10 months, he decided to leave, and so I carried it on on my own. Uh, and it's really about uh, exploring storytelling on film, um, and and how and all the the different ways in which stories are told. Uh, very much like our conversation today, you know, uh, you know, you can put certain films in a very simple box and simple motivation and people walk away one and done and Cassavetes, you can never be one and done because they're very, very different. So just really exploring and reviewing uh, films in a very in-depth way and how the stories were told on film. And then I also do interviews with various people who work in film. Uh, I have a lot of writers on people who write uh, books on film um, and actors and directors and screenwriters and stuff like that. So you can find it on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. And I'm also on uh, Instagram at the same uh, same name, at Robert Bellissimo at the movies. Twitter is a little different. It's uh, at RB at the movies. And there's a Facebook page uh, as well. But it's, uh, it's pretty easy to find. Even if you just Google Robert Bellissimo, uh, it'll come up. Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it. And everybody else, stick around. We'll be right back with our picks for the National Film Registry. The National Film Registry isn't some fixed object, frozen in time. It's always growing, adding new titles every year. These annual selections are made by the National Film Preservation Board, with members like Martin Scorsese, Alfre Woodard, and Leonard Maltin and representatives from organizations like the Academy, the DGA, and the AFI coming together to debate and decide. But they don't just pull titles out of thin air. They pull from the public, people like you and us, who can submit their nominations for the registry in a form on the Library of Congress's website. What we do, at the end of each episode, is have Mike and Tom pick films not yet in the registry that they feel should be, inspired by that day's topic. At the end of each season, those films will be formally submitted to the National Film Registry for consideration on behalf of your missing out. Here are today's picks. I'm going first on this one because I'm picking probably the second best movie John Cassavetes ever made. And it's not actually a John Cassavetes movie. I'm picking Mikey and Nikki, which is an Elaine May movie that she made with Cassavetes and Peter Falk. And it feels so much like a John Cassavetes movie that I kind of wouldn't be mad. I, I mean, I'd be mad, but I'd understand if people started a Toby Hooper, like didn't direct Poltergeist thing with this movie. Cause it's just so fucking Cassavetes and it's so good. And it's so again, well-informed, very lived in very just brutally real, but very funny. It's about toxic masculinity without ever really like being didactic about it. Uh, it's an utter masterpiece. Elaine May, absolute. It's, I mean, probably her best movie. Uh, it's, it's just a stunning work. And in this era where we're finally like reconsidering Elaine May and not leaving her in the dustbin of history, it's, uh, it feels like she has to get this movie in. 
And since the heartbreak kid is literally unwatchable because you just can't watch it anywhere. Maybe the one that's actually available to watch on the Criterion channel on Criterion Disc could be the one to do it so people can actually see it. So my pick is Mikey and Nikki. You know she is in the registry, right? She is? For what? A New Leaf is in the registry. Is it? first film. Yeah, A New Leaf is in the registry. When did it get in? Yeah, a while back. Uh, a little while back, okay. but yeah. Which, A New Leaf also. 2019. 2019, yeah. the year we started the year this before we started, show. Okay. Yeah, the year yeah. before we started this show. The year before. What, what is time? Okay, yeah. cause a wheel. So, no. Uh, so, yes. So, but, yes. Nevertheless, uh, Mikey and Nikki, Mick, you're making me, f- Mick, you're making me forget the caddish. Uh, very funny line. In the run-up to the show, I had a particular movie I wanted to highlight here, um, which I'll probably talk about in another episode. But then, in my research, you know, one of the things I like to do ahead of these movies is I like to watch the other Oscar nominees. And at least the other best, the best picture nominees from that year, I like to watch to get a sense of context. So obviously watching the Towering Inferno, things like that. But I decided because I was looking at that best actress lineup and that best actress lineup, I was like, well, there's Valerie Perrine in Lenny. I've seen Lenny. There's obviously Alice doesn't live here anymore. Ellen Burstyn. I've seen that. Uh, Faye Dunaway, Chinatown. I've seen that. And then there's Diane Carroll for this movie, Claudine. And it's interesting because Claudine doesn't get talked about much anymore. Uh, And it was put in the Criterion Collection, I think, a year ago. And I bought it just on a blind buy of like, oh, I know this got an Oscar nomination. I'm curious. Brought it home and and my family responded with like, oh, I remember that movie. So it it was a big deal at the time. And it deserves to be a big deal again. So my registry pick is, is Claudine. And not just because of an incredible soundtrack. And a truly extraordinary performance from Diane Carroll. And a great performance by James Earl Jones. But also because it was a movie that endeavored to depict not just black American life uh, at a time where the big thing was black exploitation films and trying to be a, a response to and rebuke of black exploitation films, but also it is an extraordinary indictment of the American welfare system. And the catch-22 that these people uh, on it are put in, and these conflicts of, so wait a minute, if we get married, then we're both off because of my income here and this and that. And, but wait a minute, but you're telling me that I have to do this thing or I can't. It is just about this, this incredibly broken system uh, that, that overcomplicates people's lives in a, in a very cruel uh, way. It, it's it, watching Claudine is incredible because it's 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 like watching I Daniel Blake without being didactic in any way. Um, and the, again, soundtrack's incredible. Diane Carroll's extraordinary. Um, I'm glad that this movie's in the Criterion Collection so more people can see it. I think it needs to be just in the full cinematic canon. Claudine is an extraordinary film and should absolutely be in the National Film Registry. Let's all go to the lobby, lobby. Thank you again to Robert Bellissimo for joining us. Next week, we bust a gut tackling an essential Marx Brothers viewing. Comic playwright Mark Levy joins us for 1933's Duck Soup. Don't forget to follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again next time. Here on You're Missing Out. They honor movies of historical, cultural, or aesthetic importance... the National Film Registry.